So we'll begin um, with this uh, video, which will kind of take you a little bit, review the anatomy, and then we'll look at, you know, <coughs> some of the physiological process and how your body adapts to some things. <clears throat> In order to stay alive, the body has to breathe air. We breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. This process is known as respiration. Breathing happens automatically. Every day, the body breathes about 20,000 times. By the time we reach 70 years old, that's about 600 million breaths. All of this breathing occurs because of the respiratory system, which includes the nose, throat, voice box, windpipe, and lungs. At the top of the respiratory system, the nostrils bring air into the nose where it's filtered, warmed, and moistened. Tiny hairs called cilia protect the nasal passageways and other parts of the respiratory tract and filter out dust and other particles that enter the nose through the breathed air. Air can also be breathed in through the mouth. The two airways of the nose and mouth meet up at the pharynx, which is located at the back of the throat. The pharynx carries both food and air and is used for digestion and respiration. One path is for food. This is called the esophagus, which leads onto the stomach. The other side is for air. It's called the trachea. A small flap of tissue, called the epiglottis, covers the air-only passage when we swallow. This stops food and liquid from going into the lungs. The larynx, or voice box, is located at the top of the trachea, the air-only pipe. This is where our vocal cords are. The trachea, or wings pipe, which is a two to three centimeter tube, then extends downwards from the bottom of the larynx for about 12 centimeters. The walls of the windpipe are made strong by stiff rings of cartilage that keep it open. The trachea is also lined with tiny hairs. They sweep foreign particles and fluids out of the airway, keeping them from entering the lungs. The windpipe divides into two branches, and each one of these enters one of the two lungs of the body. Each branch resembles the limbs of a tree dividing into smaller, finer branches called bronchioles. The bronchioles end in tiny air sacs called alveoli, which look a bit like grapes. These structures enable fresh air to get to the air sacs, which are surrounded by tiny blood vessels, or capillaries. The oxygen passes through these air sacs and travels through the capillary walls into the bloodstream. At the same time, carbon dioxide transfers from the bloodstream into the air sacs, where it gets breathed out of the body. When we exercise, the body needs more oxygen to feed the muscles as they work harder. The body responds by breathing more quickly and deeply. As the cells of the muscles use up more oxygen, the lungs have to work harder to keep up the supply. The respiratory system then speeds up to supply the body with much needed oxygen, and also to get rid of the carbon dioxide waste in the system. Over time, exercising also helps our chest cavity to get bigger, which enables the body to increase the amount of air it takes in. More capillaries form around the air sacs, so the body gets better at swapping oxygen and carbon dioxide gases. We can see how the body's respiratory system helps the body to move about, and is influenced by regular and ongoing physical activity as well. So, <clears throat> let's take a look at all the topics under which you are going to study respiratory physiology. So the first is breathing. You know, you saw how you kind of had to breathe in and out, breathe in to take in air and breathe out to remove the carbon dioxide. This process of breathing in and out is known as ventilation. Then there is gas exchange. There are two levels at which gas exchange occurs. The first one, as you saw in this uh, video, was at the lungs, where oxygen from the alveoli get into the pulmonary capillaries and carbon dioxide from the capillaries get into the alveoli. This is known as external respiration. Then that oxygen is carried, remember, to the left atrium, goes into the left ventricle, goes into the aorta through all its branches from where it goes to the tissues. The primary purpose is that you take that oxygen to carry it to the tissues. Then at the tissue, the reverse happens. From the blood, oxygen goes into the tissues, and the tissues which metabolize and form carbon dioxide, they give it into the blood. 
And then that blood is venous, which comes back to the heart, and then you go back to the lungs, right? So that exchange of gases, which occurs at the tissue level, is known as internal respiration. And remember, external and internal, the direction is opposite of what goes into blood and what comes out of the blood, okay? Gas transport is the pathway that we'll see how this gas is transported when from the lungs the oxygen and carbon dioxide are carried to the tissues or carried away from the tissue. So that is gas transport. And finally, we have how respiration is controlled and we'll see that there are some respiratory centers which are present because you all know you can hold your breath for only so long, right? Also, for example, like it showed in the movie up there, in the video up there, like when you exercise, your respiratory rate goes up. That's known as hyperventilation. And if you are at rest, your respiratory rate will come down. Okay, so that we'll see how that is influenced. Let's take another look at this physiology, which kind of shows you. <clears throat> So let's look at mechanics of breathing, which I just showed you a little bit in that video. So there are two pressures you need to take care of. The first was, is the pressure inside the alveoli of the lung, which is known as intrapulmonary pressure. The aim is to, during breathing, you want to make sure that the intrapulmonary pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure. Sometimes the intrapulmonary pressure is low, at other times the intrapulmonary pressures are high, and that's what lets air get in and get out. But at, it comes to a point where it becomes equal to atmospheric pressure, and at that point there's no air coming in or no air get, getting out, okay? The second pressure is the pressure in the pleural cavity which surrounds the lungs. This pressure is always negative. Remember, there was fluid present in the pleural cavity. You always want this pressure to be negative because if this pressure becomes positive, what will it do? It will push against the lungs and cause lungs to collapse, right? We saw how pneumothorax can do, do that. So these are two pressures that we are concerned with. Let's look at two forces that we have. One is that the lungs have a lot of elastic tissue in them, in, in the bronchioles and, you know, surrounding the alveolar, alveolar walls it, itself in the interalveolar septa, you have elastic tissue. And elastic tissue, when stretched, has a tendency to recoil and come back to normal. So there's this recoil of lungs which tends to kind of make the alveoli shrink. And at the same time, remember the mucus from the upper respiratory passages pass all the way down go into the alveoli and they create those water molecules kind of line the surface of the alveoli and there's a surface tension. And that surface tension also tends to make the alveolar walls adhere to each other. Okay, so there are two forces which try to make the alveoli collapse. But this is opposed by two forces. One you already know of, surfactant. Remember surfactant which is produced by the type 2 cells that decreases the surface tension. So it counteracts this tendency of the alveolar walls to collapse. It counteracts that, so it helps to keep the alveolar walls inflated, which is why you need surfactant. And we saw how premature babies who don't have surfactant suffer from that infant respiratory distress syndrome. The second is the chest wall has its own elasticity. So when you breathe in, as the chest wall expands, because the parietal pleura is lining the inside of the chest wall, the parietal pleura kind of drags with it, and it kind of pulls the lungs with it. So therefore, the lungs inflate. So the, this opposing force of trying to inflate the alveoli opposes the normal tendency of the alveoli to collapse, and this force kind of wins, which is why we are able to breathe. So that's how the negative and the positive pressures kind of balance each other out. So let's see what happens if there is a problem. So take a look at this question here, which is 
this guy is involved in a gang fight, stabbed on the right side. He has to be rushed because his breathing is severely compromised. Why do you think that is so? Excellent. Air has entered his pleural cavity. So the intrapleural pressure has become positive and it exceeds the intrapulmonary pressure. See here when we look at ventilation, there are two steps to ventilation. Inspiration is an active process. You want to increase your chest cavity. You want to increase, you want to inflate it to the maximum so that your lungs will inflate along with it. So if you look at your chest cavity, you have a vertical diameter, which is from the top of the thoracic cage down to the diaphragm. So that's the vertical diameter you have. So you want to increase that vertical diameter. You want to increase this transverse diameter, so from the sides of the chest walls, you want to kind of increase that. And you also want to increase what is the anteroposterior diameter. So if you look at the thoracic cage from the side, if this is the sternum, and here is the vertebral column, and here are the ribs. You also want to increase this diameter if possible, and you will see how this diameter can be increased. So this is anteroposterior diameter, which means if there was a way that you could push the sternum forwards, then you could increase the anteroposterior diameter. So if you increase all these three diameters, your entire thoracic volume would increase, right? And along with it, the lung volume would also increase. <coughs> The two muscles which are responsible for inspiration, which is active, are the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles. The diaphragm is responsible for about 75% of your inspiration. Obviously, external intercostals for the remaining 25. If either one of them is paralyzed, the other one at rest can take over, at rest. So if the diaphragm was paralyzed, the external intercostals at rest could take over if only the diaphragm was paralyzed, okay? The external intercostals at rest could take over. Then if you had to kind of breathe ex during exertion, that might become a problem. You all know that sometimes you've kind of got to force yourself to inspire. Let's say you're climbing up a hill. It becomes difficult to breathe, so you have forced inspiration. Or if you've ever looked at a patient who has asthma or who has re is in respiratory distress, you would notice some other muscles other than the diaphragm and external intercostals come into play. These muscles are the sternocleidomastoids. If you ever watch an asthmatic patient, you will notice that these sternocleidomastoids, which are present here, really stick out. They kind of become really, really prominent. Because the sternocleidomastoid is attached to the sternum and the clavicles, what it does is it pulls the sternum and clavicle up and forward. So it, again, it helps to increase the thoracic, the volume of the thoracic cage. Yeah. Um, I used to work at a med spa, and they actually inject the, the Botox. Does that affect breathing at all, or does that have a problem? No, it's only sternocleidomastoid is only called in during forced inspiration, and I don't know whether they would inject the sternocleidomastoid, what they're probably injecting is a thin muscle present under the skin called platysma, which is responsible for the wrinkling of the neck. They're probably injecting that, the platysma, which other than helping you to tie a tie, it doesn't have much, uh, okay? Um, uh, the other muscles are scalenes and pectoralis major. And pectoralis major, you did in A and P1. Pectoralis major, is, remember, is attached to the front of the chest wall, okay, and goes to the humerus. So imagine if you were to keep your humerus fixed like this, like you will notice asthmatic patients or patients in respiratory distress usually keep a couple of pillows and then they'll put their arms over that, keeping their arms stationary. And now what the sternocleidomastoid does is from here it pulls on the chest wall. So can you see it will lift up the rib cage. So that's how the pectoralis major is also an accessory muscle of inspiration. But they, these three come into play only when you have to exert, not at rest. Okay? Um, say you're working out sprints or, or whatever and you get the, the chest pain. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. What causes that? Like you're not getting enough air or too much pressure in the chest? Part? I mean, when, when you're working uh, out and you kind of uh, exceed your normal level of workout and you get that little thing, that's because you're hyperventilating. Your body at that time needs more oxygen. It probably could be going into what's called oxygen debt. So you've got to slow down a little bit because, you know, your tissues require more oxygen than they're getting, especially if you're not trained. Because if you're trained, you know how to kind of, you know, uh, regularize your uh, exercise so that you get your tissues are provided with as much oxygen as needed. So when you get that, there's that overinflation for a little bit, and so that might ca- be causing the pain. Okay. So let's look at how inspiration actually occurs. Um, we use this law, which is called Boyle's Law. And I, I don't know if you all remember physics, But what this law states is that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. That means if the volume increases, the pressure will decrease. Okay? See this? If the volume increases, so this, if we say this is equal to 1 over V, if we increase the denominator, you automatically can see that the pressure will decrease. Right? Got that? If the volume decreases, the pressure will increase. Followed? Okay. (coughs) So this is important when we do inspiration. So what happens during inspiration is what are you trying to do? You're trying to increase the vertical diameter. You're trying to increase the transverse diameter. And you're trying to increase the anteroposterior diameter. By doing all this, you increase the volume inside the thoracic cage. When you increase the volume inside the thoracic cage, the pressure decreases. So the intrapulmonary pressure decreases based on this formula. When the pressure in the lungs is less than atmospheric pressure, what will happen? Air will begin to flow in, right? Always goes from high to low pressure. You see that? And later we'll see in expiration, what you do is everything comes back to normal. So now your volume decreases, which means your pressure inside increases. So air will begin to flow out. To explain this concept a little more, let's take a look at this. In order to understand the mechanism for breathing, it's important to understand the relationship between pressure and volume. This is explained through Boyle's Law, which states that the pressure of a gas in a closed container is inversely proportional to the volume of the container. What do we mean by this? If the size of the closed container is decreased, the pressure of the gas inside the container increases. And that if the size of the container increases, the pressure of the gas inside the container decreases. Imagine a gas, shown here as blue molecules, inside a cylinder with a movable piston and a pressure gauge. If the piston is pushed down, the available space inside the cylinder is reduced, which compresses the gas. This means that the same number of gas molecules have less space to move around in, with the effect that they strike the walls of the cylinder with more frequency. If you observe the pressure gauge, you'll see that the pressure doubles as the volume is reduced to half. Conversely, if the piston is pulled up, the available space inside the cylinder is increased. This means that the gas molecules have more space to move around in, with the effect that they strike the walls of the cylinder with less frequency. In this case, as the volume doubles, the pressure is reduced to half. And it's these differences in pressure caused by changes in lung volume that allow us to breathe. So let's take a look at this and how the volume of the thoracic cage is increased. So first let's look at the diaphragm. So here's the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is, if you look at it, in front view, if I was to show you like this, the diaphragm is dome shaped with the right dome being higher than the left. So you can see this, this is dome shaped, right? 
it's kind of raised this way. That's why the lungs are at the bottom, they are concave over here because they're sitting on top of the dome of the diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts, what the diaphragm does is these domes become straight or just slightly elevated like this. So can you see from this position, if the diaphragm now descends to this position, how the vertical diameter of the thoracic cavity will increase, right? If it descends from its original position. When thoracic cavity vertical diameter is increased, the, the pleura, parietal pleura will go with it, which will pull the visceral pleura with it, and hence lung volume will also increase in a vertical fashion, okay? So vertical diameter is increased because the diaphragm contracts and descends from its height to a lower height. Let's look at transverse diameter, this diameter, that means from side to side. If you look at these ribs in resting position, the ribs are in an, ob they lie obliquely like this. And this kind of a movement is typically what is called a bucket handle movement. Now let me show you what happens. Take a bucket which is lying with its handle on the side like this, okay? So let me draw a better one. So here's the handle of the bucket lying on the side. This is the diameter at this point. Now when I lift the handle up, I make it horizontal or instead of it lying obliquely, can you see that the transverse diameter will increase? Okay, so the external intercostals which are attached from the above rib to the lower rib, what they do is they act on the rib below and from its oblique position, so it's lying obliquely like this, they now straighten this out and so the rib lies transversely or in a more horizontal fashion. All the ribs lie in a more horizontal fashion. So you can understand that how the transverse diameter will increase. So from this position when they become like this, you can see how the transverse diameter will increase, okay? It also so happens that the ribs increase in length, and next time we go to the lab, take a look at the skeleton, thoracic cage. The first rib is the shortest rib, second a bit longer. So the ribs increase in length from above downwards, till about the seventh or eighth rib, and then they begin to decrease in length. If you recall your A and P1, the first seven pairs of ribs were called true ribs because they were attached to the sternum, right? So when rib number two becomes straight, it'll go up, it'll kind of move up. So it is going to occupy the position of where rib number one was. When rib number three becomes straight, it's going to occupy the position of rib number two. Rib number four becomes more horizontal, it's going to occupy the position of the rib above. Can you see that? So in other words, a longer rib is going to occupy the space vacated by a shorter rib. So how is it going to be able to occupy that space if it is longer? The only way it can do that is if it pushed the sternum forward. Remember, the sternum has two joints, the manubriosternal joint and the ziphi sternal joint. These were fibrocartilaginous joints which can move. So the sternum actually moves forward so that this longer rib, when it occupies the space vacated by a shorter rib, that rib can occupy that space by pushing the sternum a bit forward. So when the sternum moves forward, you can understand that the anteroposterior diameter is going to be increased, okay? So therefore, the vertical diameter is done by the diaphragm and the elevation of the ribs and the sternum, so AP and transverse diameter is done by the external intercostal muscles. So the entire volume of the thoracic cage increases with in all diameters because of these two muscles. So let's take a look at this too. <clears throat> the mechanics of breathing involve changing the volume and pressure of the thoracic cavity. By using the principles of Boyle's law, one can see that the pressure in the thoracic cavity is inversely proportional to its volume. When the intercostal muscles contract, the ribs are elevated. At the same time, the diaphragm contracts. These events expand the thoracic cavity, decreasing its internal pressure. The lungs expand, filling the thoracic cavity. The resulting pressure in the lungs is lower than that outside the body. Air enters the lungs until equilibrium is reached. 
When the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles relax, the thoracic cavity recoils. The resulting increase in pressure causes the air within the lungs to be expelled. So here you can see that when you increased the volume, uh, increased the thoracic volume, the lung volume also increased with it. And we saw just now that volume was inversely proportional to pressure. So when pressure inside the lung becomes less than atmospheric pressure, right? Remember atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters. So when it becomes less, air begins to flow into the lungs. When they equalize, air stops flowing. Inspiration will stop at that time. Then passively, okay, let me go back. Passively, the, the diaphragm will recoil, the external intercostals will relax, and the thoracic volume will come back. It will sort of decrease. Pressure will increase inside the lungs. So pressure inside the lungs at that point is more than atmospheric pressure. So expiration begins and air begins to flow out till it reaches atmospheric pressure, and then the next cycle will start. Okay? So let's answer a few questions. Why does air move into the lungs during inspiration? Okay, the volume is in the lung has increased. The pressure has decreased. Remember, the, the you did, uh, in, again, in ANP1, you did diffusion, you did filtration, where things moved from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration, or you did something called moving from infiltration, moving from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure, right? So this is that. It's not called filtration. It's actually just passage of gas. So because atmospheric pressure is more than pressure inside the lung, so it will go from a higher pressure into the lungs. Okay? So that's why air flows into the lungs. Which muscles increase the transverse diameter? External intercostals, not internal. Remember, we didn't even see internal written, written over there. External intercostal muscles. Not diaphragm, just external intercostal muscles. Expiration is the exact, exact opposite, only it is passive. It occurs because everything just goes back, recoils, and goes back to normal. The only time external uh, um, expiration is active is when it is in forced expiration. Can you give me an example of when you would do forced expiration? Yes, when you're blowing out, blowing up a balloon or something, that's when you're using forced expiration. It's only then that muscles come into play and those muscles would be the internal intercostals which take part and the abdominal muscles, okay? So during forced Expiration, it is then that internal intercostals and abdominal muscles, your rectus abdominis and, and the obliques, that's when they take part. But otherwise, it's a passive process. So the diaphragm goes back to its normal position. So what happens? So this is where the diaphragm in its contracted state was. So here the vertical diameter had increased during inspiration. So now when the diaphragm goes back to its normal position, so you can see now here the volume has decreased this way, so pressure will increase. The thoracic cage comes back to normal, so it goes back to its oblique position, so both transverse and AP diameters decrease, and again that increases pressure. So the pressure inside the lungs is more than the outside, so air begins to flow out. Okay? The diaphragm is... When you when you go very deep, that's why you need you need that you need an apparatus to do that, and that's why in fact when you start coming up, you cannot come up really fast. You have to come very very slowly, otherwise gases yeah the gases you get those bends, 
the gases inside begin to bubble. So that's why you have to take precautions. And also you should dive slowly and not kind of go, you know, straight down because you have to acclim yeah, acclimate to the pressure. The diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve, which is from the cervical segments of the spinal cord. So if you take the spinal cord like this, and this is the brain, because in fetal life, the diaphragm developed in the neck region, and then it descended to its original point. So therefore, it gets its nerve supply from its embryological origin, which is cervical three to five segments of the spinal cord. And this nerve then drags all its way down. That's why you see the nerve in the neck and all the way down to the thorax till it reaches the diaphragm as, we, as in the adult. The intercostal muscles are supplied by intercostal nerves from T1 and the subcostal, which is T12. So those supply the intercostal muscles. If just this phrenic nerve was cut, so if, imagine just the phrenic nerve was cut, the intercostal nerves would still be okay. And that's why I said that you can, you know, at rest, respiration can still happen. Or let's say theoretically, if the intercostal muscles were all cut like this, uh, or from this segment, the, you know, there was a problem, the diaphragm could still function and that it would work. But imagine if you, <clears throat> if there was a cervical cord injury up here, like happened like it happened to the super, uh, Christopher Reeve. What happens? From above, no impulses will come down. So the phrenic nerve is also knocked off. The diaphragm is, uh, I mean, the diaphragm is knocked off. The intercostal nerves and muscles are all gone. So none of the inspiratory muscles will work. So it would be fatal, which is why they need to be put on a respirator. Or like in his case, that's when they started what was called phrenic pacing where his phrenic nerve was intact. So just like a pacemaker, they had a little electrode which kept stimulating the phrenic nerve. So it made the diaphragm contract. Okay, there was a question there? Okay. So here is expiration. Everything comes back, <clears throat> back to normal. So the diaphragm rises. The external intercostals relax. So from a transverse position, the ribs become oblique again. The sternum goes back to normal. Pressure volume decreases, so pressure increases, so air begins to flow out. Okay, so that's how expiration occurs. In forced expiration only, that's where you use internal, ex internal intercostals and abdominal muscles. Go home, try to blow into a balloon and put your hand on your rectus abdominis and you'll see the rectus abdominis contracting. Let's look at some factors which affect ventilation. If you think of all of these, it's really common sense. First and foremost, in order for air to go into the lungs, the first, air, I mean, no, apart from nasal cavity, you shouldn't have a absolutely deviated septum or you shouldn't have huge polyps in your nose and all that. So we take everything there to be granted. The first area where you can expect there could be a problem is the glottis which is between the vocal folds. Remember, that was the narrowest part of the larynx. So you want to make sure that the glottic abductors are working properly, right? If they are not, then there would be a problem. And that's why that posterior cricoarytenoid muscle is really important because it was the only abductor of the vocal cords. And anesthetized patients, you always have to, when you give them general anesthesia, you, and especially for very long periods, you always have to put a tube inside because it causes these muscles to relax and, you know, the abductors would not be acting and the, they could, you know, abductors could take over. Next is airway resistance. Obviously, you do not want the smooth muscle in the bronchi and the bronchioles to be, con to be contracting because what would happen? If they contract, they make the the lumen of the bronchi and the bronchioles narrow, which means they increase the resistance because whenever anything becomes narrow, resistance increases. Remember peripheral resistance from uh, when we did circulatory system? So it'll be more difficult for air to get in. And this we will see that normally, and see how the body sort of homeostatically helps itself. So therefore, when you're inspiring, there is a slight amount of bronchodilation so that air can get into the alveoli properly. And during expiration, there's a slight amount of bronchoconstriction to kind of help to squeeze the air out. So there's a minimal 
amount of bronchoconstriction. Also, this helps the, uh, so that some amount of uh, air is left behind in the lungs. Remember when we did um, the heart and we did stroke volume, we had some amount of blood left behind inside the chambers of the heart, which was called end systolic volume. The heart chambers didn't completely empty themselves out. Same way, the lung doesn't completely empty itself out of all air. If it did that, then the alveolar walls would kind of touch each other, right? They would collapse. So there's always some amount of residual air which is left behind in the lungs. And you can understand that in people who have uh, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where they have a lot of bronchoconstriction, what will happen? The amount of residual air left behind in the lungs will be much more because of this excessive bronchoconstriction. Then you have something known as lung compliance. The word compliance means um, to accommodate. In general, general terms, if I say, oh, this person is a compliant person, that means as an accommodating person, they go with the flow. By lung compliance we and chest wall compliance, we mean the same thing, the flexibility of the lungs and the chest wall or the, uh, the ability to accommodate. Okay, so in case of lung and uh, chest wall, we'll use the word flexibility. Even in general terms, oh, that person is compliant, we say they're flexible. If you tell them to work late hours, they work late hours. If you tell them to go home early, they do that. So the word compliance truly means like flexibility or accommodating. So here also, the lungs and the chest wall both have to be compliant. The lungs have to allow themselves, the alveoli have to allow themselves to distend. So the elasticity should be there. The surface tension also should be low because and so enough surfactant should be produced plus the chest wall also that means the sternum should allow itself to move forwards the ribs should allow themselves to uh, you know from an oblique position to straighten up because if the chest wall is deformed in some way imagine somebody has a problem with the chest wall let's say the sternum is funnel chested or the ribs have not developed properly or there's a vertebral column problem where you know the chest one side of the chest wall is kind of a little uh, lopsided compared to the others. You can see then it will not be able, it won't be as compliant as a normal chest wall, right? So the chest wall also should be compliant. If all of these things are flexible, then obviously the amount of air going in and out of the lungs will be as you desire, okay? So the, all these three things you can see are important for ventilation to occur. So let's look at airway resistance and what happens in some situations. <clears throat> Asthma is typically characterized by coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. When allergens or environmental factors cause a spike in these symptoms, it is known as an asthma attack. During an asthma attack, the large airways, called bronchi, react to a trigger like an allergen with contracting spasms. The bronchi inflame and produce mucus, further narrowing the airways and leading to the symptoms of asthma. Attacks may last just a few minutes, or can linger over several days. Symptoms can usually be relieved using asthma medications, but may also dissipate naturally in mild attacks. So here you can see that's why people with asthma have breathing problems. And here you can understand why you give them drugs which act like the sympathetic nervous system. Remember what was the action of the sympathetic nervous system on the bronchi? Causing bronchodilation. Right? So that's why you'll give them drugs acting like that. You had a question? Um, yeah, can, like, when you, uh, they can, because I work in the emergency room, so like when they come in and have to go to the breath, can you put the oxygen on them? What is that doing to the lungs? Like, is it, is it, because I know you circulate, why, why does the oxygen help them breathe better than when you're just breathing on your own? I don't know. The oxygen doesn't help them breathe better. It is when they are respiratory distress, they are not getting enough oxygen. So they are not getting enough oxygen because of whatever the problem may be, right? It could be, it could be, uh, it may not necessarily be respiratory. It could be cardiovascular. 
So when you give them oxygen, you're, in, you're making sure that enough oxygen gets into the lungs so that gas exchange occurs well and their blood vessels are properly oxygenated to carry enough oxygen to the tissues. Air, you're forcing oxygen into them. Yes, yeah, okay. Then here, let's look at, so asthma, as you can see, was a kind of disease which was obstructive in nature because it caused uh, the uh, bronchi and the bronchioles to constrict, right? You have certain diseases which are restrictive in nature. So, for example, they, the uh, chest wall deformity. It restricts the chest wall from um, increasing its diameters. That could be restricted. Or you could have a disease such as, uh, you've heard, you know, you may have uh, seen these commercials of, uh, did you work in a factory where there was asbestos? And so if you are suffering from asbestosis, you can file for um, compensation and all that. That's because asbestos and all of these, um, and or even if you go to coal mine, uh, all the dust, the fine dust gets inside you know, you breathe that in, it's so fine, it gets inside, and what it does is it goes and deposits in the interalveolar septa, and it prevents the elastic tissue of the lungs from expanding. So again, it restricts them. So can you see? So those kind of diseases are become restrictive kind of diseases. So let's take a look at lung compliance. <clears throat> So having, an, I'm, I'm showing you a lot of videos just so that I can get the concepts of these things and you remember them. So let's take a look at <clears throat> this question. So imagine somebody has this condition called scoliosis. Do you think it would affect chest wall compliance? Just 14 people? I'm going to wait for a few more. I guess not. Okay. Yes, very good. It will affect chest wall compliance because imagine if somebody has scoliosis, which is like this. That's the vertebral column. Imagine the ribs on this side. The ribs on this side would not be normal, right? On this side, they would be okay. Or even this side, the part, this curvature here would also affect the ribs. So the ribs will not be able to get to the, from their oblique to the horizontal position in a normal fashion. So it would end up causing chest wall compliance, okay? But yeah, the diameter would be different. It wouldn't move properly because the, the ribs have to move from their attachment on the vertebra, that's their fulcrum, they have to move at that point. 
if that attachment becomes affected, they are not able to move properly. Okay. Here's another question. Why do you think coal miners are likely to suffer from severe respiratory problems? I did go over this and gave you a hint. So everybody should get this right. Good job, yes. Coal dust can settle in the scepter and reduce elasticity. <clears throat> now let's look at lung volumes, and here's where you try to think of this to what uh, certain volumes which you <coughs> did when you were doing um, the cardiovascular system. It'll kind of help you a little bit, okay? Tidal volume is the volume that you inspire or expire at rest. This is at rest, either inspiration or expiration, at rest, okay? Normal amount is 500 ml. Look at these words, and then it becomes a bit self-explanatory. You don't really have to strain your brains to remember that. Inspiratory reserve volume. That means the volume which you can inspire, but you keep it in reserve. Okay, so inspiratory reserve volume, this is the volume you can inspire. You do not inspire it all the time. It is just kept in reserve because what you inspire during normal time is your tidal volume. So imagine somebody takes a normal breath and then takes another deep breath. After the normal breath, the second deep breath they have inspired, that is what is called inspiratory reserve volume. Do you follow? Okay, so it does not include tidal, tidal volume. It's over and above the tidal volume. So imagine, for ex if, if I show it to you, so I'm just breathing normally. That's my normal tidal volume. So after my tidal volume, the amount that I breathe in, that's my inspiratory reserve volume. It is anywhere between 2100 to 3200 ml. This is just a given range that you give. Expiratory reserve volume. It's the volume that you can expire. Keep it in reserve. You do not expire it all the time. But this is the volume you can expire after your tidal volume. So remember, tidal volume was normal volume at rest, expired or inspired. So, for example, if you want to blow into a balloon, that is your forced expiration, remember? So you breathe out and then you breathe out again. That is your expiratory reserve volume. So this, again, is over and above your tidal volume. So this is about 1,000 to 1,200 ml. You can understand that inspiratory reserve volume would be decreased in restrictive pulmonary disease. Anything which prevents you from inspiring properly would kind of decrease, in, uh, decrease your capacity to inspire more, right? So in restrictive diseases, it will it'll, uh, it'll be affected. Expiratory reserve volume, this would, uh, would decrease greatly in COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Remember I told you in asthma, what does obstructive pulmonary disease do? It kind of obstructs the bronchi, which means it's difficult enough for air to go in, but it's more difficult for air to go out, which means more air is left behind in the lungs. Remember that residual air. So therefore, expiratory reserve volume decreases greatly in chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Two diseases which belong to this category are chronic bronchitis and emphysema. You've, I'm sure you have heard of these conditions. If you look at these patients, especially a patient with emphysema, you will notice that they are really barrel-chested. They, they look like they, they work out a lot and they kind of look very beefy, but you actually go close to them, you find them breathing, strained breathing. The reason they are barrel chested is because they cannot expire that well, so a lot of volume is left behind in the lungs, so the residual volume keeps on increasing, which means the lungs are constantly expanded, which means that their chest cavity has to expand to, to accommodate that residual volume. That's why they look like, you know, they are very, very barrel-chested because of this reason. 
Residual volume is the volume which is left behind in the lungs. So if you compare this to the cardiovascular system, you can say tidal volume is somewhat similar to stroke volume, somewhat similar. Residual volume is somewhat similar to end systolic volume, the amount of blood which is left behind in the heart after the uh, chamber has contracted. Similarly, residual volume is the amount of uh, air that is left behind in the lungs after you've expired, okay? Vital capacity, which is about 4,800 4, ml, is what is called the total amount of air that can be exchanged, the total amount of exchangeable air, which includes tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume. This is the amount of air that can be exchanged. Your total lung capacity is all four volumes put together. That means tidal, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, and residual volume. Now, when you breathe in air, you breathe in 500 ml of air, but not all 500, actually speaking, can be exchanged. Because remember, you have two zones in your respiratory system, the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. The conducting zone goes from the nasal cavity down to the respiratory bronchiole. There's always some air present in that, right? That part. That you cannot exchange. The only part which you can exchange is the part which is in the respiratory zone down to the alveoli. So the air which is present in the conducting zone is known as the anatomical dead space. It's said to be present in the anatomical dead space. No gas exchange occurs there. It is normally taken as about 1 ml per pound of body weight. So if there is a person who is uh, 150 pounds, their anatomical dead space would be 150 ml. So if they take in 500 ml of uh, tidal volume, only three, 350 ml, which is, which is the amount which can be exchanged. Followed? Right? Okay. This anatomical dead space can increase if any other part of the lung of the respiratory zone gets damaged. Because dead space by definition is where no gas exchange occurs. No, in a normal person, it is the entire conducting zone, right? Because that's where no gas exchange occurs. But physiologically, it can in increase if some part of the respiratory zone is diseased, then that would also be included in, in the dead space because no gas exchange is occurring. Are you followed? Okay. So here if you look at tidal volumes in a graphical form, uh, I mean you look at the lung volumes in a graphical form, this is tidal volume, amount of air you can breathe in or out at normal respiration at rest. Inspiratory reserve volume, so you breathe in normally and then over and above you breathe that, that's inspiratory reserve volume. Expiratory reserve volume, you breathe out and over and above what you breathe out is called expiratory reserve volume. All of this together, that means inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume. This is actually the total amount of air that can be exchanged. So this is called vital capacity. This is your total lung capacity because you always have some air left behind in your lungs. And then when you think of something called functional residual capacity, because you never, you, you normally do not, if you're just breathing at rest, you'll have this volume of air left in your lungs, plus you'll have the expiratory reserve volume because that's what you hold in reserve. So this is what is called functional residual capacity. Okay? So I'll go over this again. Tidal volume, air breathe in or out, just this part. You either breathe in or you breathe out, 500 ml. If after breathing in, you continue to breathe and you breathe till you can't breathe anymore, that is what is called inspiratory reserve volume. That's in reserve, but you can do it if you want to. Then, if you breathe out, you breathe out, and you continue to breathe out like you're blowing a balloon, that is called expiratory reserve volume. If you do not breathe that out, that part will be left behind in the lungs, and then we always have this residual volume left behind in the lungs. So therefore, when you add these two, this is what is normally what is called your functional residual capacity. This is the amount that you can keep in your lungs. Okay? 
So here, let's uh, take a look at some questions. Are bronchioles part of dead space? Yes, they are. Remember, I just used the word bronchioles. Remember, anything in the conducting zone is dead space. The uh, respiratory zone is from respiratory bronchiole. Unless we use the word respiratory bronchiole, you cannot call it uh, part of the respiratory zone. So when I'm saying just bronchioles, it's part of the conducting zone. So let's say you get a question like this. Todd has a tumor as one of his right secondary bronchi, which has led to collapse of the middle lobe of his right lung. So what will the result be on the dead space? Yes, it will increase. Remember, dead space is an area where no gas exchange occurs. So here, because he has atelectasis, no gas exchange has occurred. So now his dead space is not only going to be the conducting zone, but added to this will be this one. So remember, I said in a normal person, the, the dead space is calculated based on the weight. So 1 ml per body weight. So if they weigh 150 pounds, you know, their dead space, we say, is 150 ml. If someone's dead space ha increased, let's say their weight was 150, but the dead space by, calcul you know, after calculation came up to 170 ml, then you realize that it could be because part of the respiratory zone has been affected. Got that? Okay. Okay, gas exchange. So we'll just kind of touch on this because this is a little um, heavy topic and then we'll uh, call it a day. So when gases, uh, and here's where you get a little bit of your chemistry um, that you did in high school or here even in college, just call upon that. So partial pressure is direct, what it says is directly proportional to the percentage of gas in a mixture. So here's where, let, let me give it to you in a different way. So let's say you have a bag of fruits, okay? The weight of the bag is, let's say, 5 pounds. Of this, what does that look like to you? Oh, okay. I was going for apple, but doesn't matter. <laughs> so let's say these weigh like 2 pounds, okay? And let's say... Yeah, it shows how, yeah, like kids in kindergarten do need to, it's not all that easy. <laughs> so let's say bananas are um, a pound. And that, apples, okay? So those are three pounds. No, those have to be two. Okay, two pounds, right? So if you had something like this. So we say that in this mixture of your bag of fruits whose weight is five pounds, the partial weight of apples is like two over five, right? The partial weight of bananas is like one over five and the partial weight of these other, other guys, apples is two over five, right? So there's all three together contribute to the total weight. But the concentration of this and this is equal, the weight of this one is, is less, okay? So that's like a part of that total weight. Do you understand? Same way if you take gas, because we don't do weight, in gas we do pressure. So if the total atmospheric pressure is 760 mm, and this is made of oxygen, and this is made of nitrogen, and this is made of carbon dioxide, all three together contribute to this total weight, but it is the part 
the partial weight of this the partial weight of this and the partial weight of this depends on how much of this gas is present there right if more carbon dioxide is present obviously the partial pressure will be more if more nitrogen is present the partial pressure will be more just like here the pressure of the weight of bananas is less <coughs> as part of this total weight because you have fewer bananas if you added more bananas and took this uh, you know cherries out then the weight of the bananas would be more got that so that's really what it means the second is gases dissolve in a liquid depending on their partial pressure and their change into a gaseous state is also dependent on partial pressure so for example when you breathe in oxygen and oxygen goes from your alveoli into blood that oxygen is carried to your tissues oxygen doesn't bubble through your blood as oxygen gas but it has to actually become liquid in order to travel in your tissues get that okay then when that same in in the tissues you produce carbon dioxide carbon dioxide also will travel in your blood in a liquid form then when it comes to the lungs you expire carbon dioxide you do not throw out water uh, watery carbon dioxide right you breathe it out as gas so that liquid carbon dioxide in the blood will actually have to change into a gaseous form in the alveoli and that's how you breathe it out got it so in other words gases go from liquid to gas form based on where they are going so if they are going from the lungs to the uh, to blood they'll go in a liquid form if from blood they get into the alveoli they'll change from liquid form to a gaseous form this conversion of going into a liquid and a gaseous form again depends on partial pressure so wherever the pressure it, everything goes from an area of higher pressure diffusion goes from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure so it will diffuse from where it's an area of higher to a lower pressure and also this dissolving in a liquid depends on that partial pressure which we'll see when we do that we'll see that the pressure of oxygen in the blood which is leaving the lungs becomes more so that's why it dissolves in that the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood is more when it reaches the alveoli so that's why it dissolves and becomes gaseous and that's why you breathe that out okay all gases do not dissolve in a liquid in the same manner so the solubility of a gas in liquid and temperature also depend determine the amount of gas that will dissolve gases can go from a liquid to a gaseous form and vice versa but not all of them do it at the same level for example carbon dioxide is 20 times more soluble in blood than oxygen is okay nitrogen is the most soluble of the gases which is why we are worried when we go deep sea and we come up really fast because it will get into a gaseous form if you don't control the pressure difference okay so we'll be looking at all this gas exchange depends on solubility and partial pressure gradients obviously if the pressure is more in the alveoli of oxygen and less in the blood vessels that's when oxygen will go from the alveoli into the blood vessels carbon dioxide is more in the blood vessels less in the alveoli that's why carbon dioxide goes into the alveoli so you'll see how that solubility and partial pressure gradient becomes important then we have something which we look at called ventilation perfusion ratio that means it's all very fine for an alveolus to be nice and inflated but that's the ventilation part perfusion means the amount of blood supply so if an alveolus is nice and inflated so it's well ventilated but the blood supply to that area is bad then it's kind of a lost cause isn't it it's like imagine you're going on a highway which is very very narrow but there too there's too many cars on that highway there's no point building a highway where you expect a lot of traffic you want to make the roads wider right so if a alveolus is really inflated you want to make sure that the blood supply coincides with that inflation so that's what is called ventilation perfusion in the first video you saw you saw how from the alveolus and here was the capillary oxygen moved in this direction carbon dioxide moved in this direction so they moved through the capillary wall uh, sorry through the capillary wall and through the alveolar wall so this area is called the respiratory membrane obviously if this area is very thick it will impede gas exchange so you want to make sure that that area is as thin as possible so that's the respiratory membrane 
and you want to make sure that the available surface area of the alveoli is as much as you can get. It's the large, the greater the surface area, the better the gas exchange. I mean, that's common sense. If you have parts of the alveoli which are atelectatic, obviously you won't have gas exchange, right? So all of these, if you think of it and think of it logically, first, gases have to be soluble. You have to have a gradient for things to pass through. Second, you've got to make sure that the blood supply and the ventilation coincide. You can't have too much blood and a bad, badly ventilated alveolus or vice versa. Third, you want to make sure that the region through which this actual gas exchange occurs, that's as thin as possible. And lastly, you want to be sure that all of the alveoli are functioning so that your surface area is good, right? Okay. So, um, looking at some properties which influence gas exchange. So, we talked of how gases, there has to be a gradient between the two areas where gas has to be exchanged, okay, because it will go from an area with higher partial pressure to an area of low partial pressure. Also, the gas should, should be soluble, and we said that carbon dioxide, oxygen are both soluble, so that helps. Uh, then there should be what is called a ventilation perfusion ratio, which is important, which is the amount of uh, blood supply to the area that is called perfusion to the area being ventilated. That means the alveolus, the inflation of the alveolus and the blood supply should coincide. So we'll look at that. Then we'll talk about the respiratory membrane, which is very important. It should be very, very thin. If it is thick, then that, make, that would create problems. And obviously, the more the surface area, the better the gas exchange. So if your alveoli are, are collapsed at a certain point, that would be a problem. So let's look at this respiratory membrane thickness. Let me try again. The process of exchanging gases between the atmosphere and the body's cells is called respiration and involves several events, including breathing. As we zoom into the body, we can observe the respiratory system during gas exchange. Air passes through the alveolar sacs to the alveoli, where gas exchange occurs. In this cutaway view of an alveolar sac and its capillary bed, the process of gas exchange is easily observed. During inspiration, atmosphere air fills the alveoli and gas exchange occurs between the alveolar and capillary epithelia. Oxygen in inspired air is represented as a white gas. Carbon dioxide in expired air is represented as a blue gas. Notice the change in color in the red blood cells during gas exchange. Now, let's zoom into a higher magnification view of gas exchange at the respiratory membrane. Red blood cells in the capillary adjacent to the alveolus release carbon dioxide and bind oxygen. So it looks like the latter half of the video for some reason is not working, but you can see how oxygen is going from there into the capillaries and carbon dioxide is going from the capillaries into the alveolus and that's what is expired. So let's look at each one of these. So the pulmonary gas exchange, which is based on partial pressure and gas solubility. So here we have two areas where this gas exchange occurs. One is at the alveolar level, which you just saw, which was called external respiration. Oxygen in the alveolus will go into the capillaries, and carbon dioxide in the capillaries will go into the alveolus so that it can be expired. The reason that happens is because of this partial pressure gradient, and we'll take a look at it. You don't have to remember the numbers, but I want you to see the gradient which is established. And then when we come to the tissues, the opposite happens. So this is called internal respiration, where in the capillaries there's more oxygen, whereas in the tissues there's more carbon dioxide, so the exchange occurs across like that. 
So let's take a look here up in the alveolus. So if you look here, you can see that in the alveolus, the partial pressure of oxygen, oxygen is about 104 millimeters of mercury, and the carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters of mercury. If you look at the arteries, the pulmonary arteries, who are bringing, which are bringing deoxygenated blood, the oxygen over here, the carbon dioxide is, where is the thing for arteries? Uh, the carbon dioxide is 45 millimeters of mercury and the oxygen is 40 millimeters of mercury. So you can see that carbon dioxide pressure is more, partial pressure is more in the capillaries, oxygen partial pressure is more in the alveoli. So therefore, oxygen from the alveoli will flow into the capillaries and carbon dioxide from the capillaries will fall, flow into the alveolus and you breathe that out. Now, this oxygen-rich blood will go into the heart, will get into the aorta. Through all its branches, it will come to the tissues. So here it's showing you one area of the tissues. So up here, if you look at the arteries, the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 and carbon dioxide is 40. But at the tissues which are metabolizing, they're producing more carbon dioxide when they metabolize. Look at the carbon dioxide. It's more than 45 and oxygen is 40. So again, a gradient is established. Since oxygen is more in the capillaries, it goes to the tissues. Carbon dioxide is more in the tissues. It goes into the capillaries, the venous end of the capillaries, and that is brought back into the heart from where it goes into the lungs and the second cycle starts. Okay? So let's take a look again at this just so that you understand this concept really well. Now, in this picture, I'm going to. In that picture, what is important for you to understand? So, this was because of partial pressure and a gradient being established. We saw how oxygen went one way and carbon dioxide went the other way. The other thing that you must understand is the gas solubility. So, when you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen as a gas. Now, that, as I told you, it cannot bubble through the arteries as gas, right? So from a gaseous state, oxygen gets converted into a liquid state, and that's what gets transported all the way till it reaches the tissues. Carbon dioxide, which is given off from the tissues, is given off in a liquid state. It will travel all the way up here, come in a liquid state to the alveoli, but you cannot blow out liquid, right? You have to blow, out, blow it out in a gaseous state. So carbon dioxide from the capillaries, when it enters the alveolus, it changes from liquid to a gaseous state, and that's how you breathe it out. So this process of changing from a liquid to a gaseous state is also dependent on partial pressure, and it's also dependent on the fact that these two gases can be soluble. They can go from a liquid to a gas state or gas to a liquid state, okay? So let's take a look at a few questions. So this has nothing to do with the partial pressure and solubility, but remember all those things we talked about. And we also should know where the pulmonary capillaries lie. So if there is pulmonary congestion, which of the following areas do you think is going to be affected?
Okay, the correct answer is the respiratory membrane thickness. And here is why. So let's take a look at this. So here is a alveolus. Here is another alveolus. And in between them is the pulmonary capillary, okay? An arterial end and a venous end. Remember, this was the respiratory membrane, the alveolar epithelium, the fused basal lamina, and the endothelium of the capillary, okay? If the pulmonary capillaries are congested, they are filled with blood, what happens? The pressure inside them increases. There's more blood. So whenever the hydrostatic pressure increases, it tends to throw fluid out. So what will happen? That fluid will go out here. So this is what is going to happen. It's kind of try and, and here are blood cells inside. I'm going to try and separate the basal lamina between them. So this respiratory membrane thickness is going to increase. The partial pressure will not change because it will be the same. The amount of carbon dioxide, whether the capillary is congested or the capillary is not, is going to remain the same. The gas solubility will still be the same because the partial pressure remains the same. The surface area of alveoli will not be affected because the alveoli have not collapsed. It's just the congestion which is occurring over there. Because this respiratory membrane thickness increases, because fluid is now deposited in the connective tissue, that's why the person has breathing problems, because it becomes difficult for gas to be exchanged, because the membrane is not as thin as it should have been. Okay? Another question. Why do you think carbon dioxide moves into the alveolus from the capillaries in the lungs? So this is a review of what we just did. So why is there movement from the capillaries into the alveolus of carbon dioxide? Yes, very good. Most of you got this right. The part, remember, it's a pressure gradient. If it moves from one area to another, it always will move from an area. This is simple diffusion, but only it's diffusion of gases. It will move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less in the alveolus, more in the capillaries. That's why it moves from the capillaries into the alveolus, and you're able to expire that. So I'm going to ask you this question, and then we'll do this, and then we'll, I'll ask you the question again, and we'll see if your answer changes. So here what I'm asking you is that this is based on ventilation perfusion ratio. That means the ratio between how much an alveolus is inflated and how much blood supply goes to that, okay? So suppose a few alveoli were not functioning properly. Let's say they were not inflated. They were less than they could be inflated, so they were very small, uh, what would be the most logical way for the body to react in terms of gas exchange? Do you think it, the body would want to increase blood supply to that, that area the, where those alveoli are not inflated, or do you think the body should decrease the blood supply to those alveoli? So think of your answer, then we'll ex explore this concept, and then we'll come back to this answer and see if your answer changes, okay? Okay, I want a few more. Last time I got 17. Okay. Okay, so most of you think that the, the logical thing to do would be decrease the blood supply, and about a third of the class thinks increase the blood supply. So let's look at this. So ventilation perfusion ratio. So here, this is a situation where the ventilation is less than the perfusion. That means the alveolus is not inflated. Whereas the perfusion is good. That means the blood supply is adequate. So there's kind of a mismatch between these two. And before you kind of we go into this concept, think of what logically, if you were a traffic coordinator, you would do. The body does pretty much the same thing. So if you had two roads, one was extremely narrow and you, the other one was wide. 
and you had a bunch, you had heavy traffic, right? Would you want to send them down the narrow road or would you want to send them down the wide road? The wide road, right? So wherever there is more space, you want to send, it makes it logical to send more traffic down that area. The body reacts in the same manner. So up here, the alveolus is not inflated, but the blood supply is really good. So the body thinks, what is the point? The alveolus here does not have enough oxygen, and my purpose is for gas exchange. So if I'm sending so much blood over there, gas exchange is not going to be very good because I don't have enough oxygen to exchange it with. So why not do something? Constrict the blood vessels here. So decrease the blood supply to this area and push it out to an area where there's a wider road or a wider alveolus. Got that? So that what it will do, it will constrict it and send it off to an area where the alveolus is well inflated. Look at this other situation. Suppose the alveolus is really well inflated, but blood supply is not that good. So let's use the same analogy. So you have a big road and very few cars going down that road. What would you want to do? You want you would want to get drive more traffic down that road because you have all that space, right? So here, imagine you have a well-inflated alveolus, but the blood supply, the blood vessels in that are a little constricted, so the blood supply to that area is not all that good. So what would be a logical thing to do? You have so much oxygen inside, die, you can dilate the alveol uh, the blood vessels, right? So you could, the blood vessels dilate in that area, blood vessels dilate, more blood or more traffic goes through, so your exchange of gases would be really good. Got that? So very, very logical way that the body would react to this. Also, at the same time, a slight thing happens. Here your alveolus is not inflated, so less oxygen is going in. So the gas exchange is less. So it's kind of, when if less oxygen is going in, carbon dioxide also less will be going out. So what the bronchi do is they dilate so that they kind of facilitate the bringing in and removal of gases. So there's, it's normal for the bronchi to dilate a little bit. In this situation, the alveolus is well inflated, blood supply you have increased by dilating the blood vessels. So the, there is no need for the bronchi to remain dilated. So there is kind of a slight bronchoconstriction so that you can expel the air out, okay? So now if I gave you the same question, what do you think your answer would be? So if alveoli were not functioning, what would be the logical way for the body to react to this? Very good. I'm glad the more of you changed your answer there and you kind of got the concept of how the body... And every, everywhere in the body, the body is most economical, never likes to do extra work, tries to... Well, I wouldn't want to use the word shortcut, but tries to do it in, the, you know, in a manner where it was going to use the least amount of energy because you don't want to waste energy, okay? So the logical thing to do would be to decrease the blood supply to that area. So that was so we did with pulmonary ventilation. Then we did uh, ventilation perfusion. Now we've got to take the gases to the tissue level. So how is gas transported? So remember, I said it goes from a gaseous situation into a liquid form. So we look at oxygen and bo both oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen is not as soluble as carbon dioxide in just general plasma. So only 2% is carried in plasma just as plain oxygen. So think of it as liquid oxygen traveling in plasma or oxygen traveling in the liquid form in plasma, only 2%. Most of it, 98% is bound to hemoglobin. The hemoglobin molecules, actually when one molecule binds to one molecule of the, in the hemoglobin, it has four heme units. Of that one unit, binds to oxygen, it kind of sets up somewhat like a cascade reaction. It makes the other units bind more readily to oxygen. So, you know, three, four, the second, third, and fourth also bind to it. So that's why we have so many hemoglobin molecules within our red blood cells. So 98% of that oxygen binds to 
hemoglobin and becomes what is known as oxyhemoglobin. So all of this then travels in the blood vessels and goes to the tissues. At the tissue level, this hemoglobin, this oxyhemoglobin, the hemoglobin readily gives up the oxygen because remember that partial pressure was more in the blood vessels than in the tissues. So hemoglobin gives up the oxygen which goes into the tissues and hemoglobin is said to be reduced. It's free now. So what it will do, you'll see that it will actually attach then to carbon dioxide and some of carbon dioxide will also be carried attached to hemoglobin and come back to the lungs. Okay. Carbon dioxide does pretty much the same thing as oxygen with a few variations. It's about 20 times more soluble, so more of carbon dioxide goes dissolved in plasma, 10%. 20% gets carried by hemoglobin because here when hemoglobin goes to the, when oxygen goes to the tissue, the hemoglobin is free. Now it can attach carbon dioxide to it. So, and some of carbon dioxide as carbon dioxide, when it gets attached, it's known as carbaminohemoglobin. And most of it, 70% of it, goes in plasma as not simple carbon dioxide, but as bicarbonate ion. And we'll see how it does this, okay? So before we look at, take a look at the equation, let's see this as a video. All cells need oxygen. It is the essential fuel which is necessary to enable cells to stay alive and to carry out their various activities. Bringing oxygen to the cells requires the uptake of oxygen from the air in the lungs, its transportation in the blood, and its delivery to cells all over the body. The first step is the taking up of oxygen by blood flowing through fine capillaries in the walls of the lungs air sacs, or alveoli. The oxygen molecules change from their state as a gas freely circulating in the air, dissolving into a solution in the plasma within the capillaries of the alveoli. Once in the solution of the blood, 98% of this dissolved oxygen is taken up by passing red cells, leaving just 2% remaining in the physical solution unattached. Red cells are particularly well suited to transporting oxygen because they contain a special oxygen binding protein known as hemoglobin. Each molecule of hemoglobin itself contains four molecules of heme, an iron containing pigment which binds oxygen loosely and reversibly. Hemoglobin that is fully saturated with oxygen is bright red and is called oxyhemoglobin. On the other hand, hemoglobin that is not saturated with oxygen is purplish blue in color and is called deoxyhemoglobin. It is heme which makes it possible for the red cells to pick up oxygen dissolved in the blood, transport it combined with hemoglobin, and release it back into the blood as oxygen in solution ready for delivery to the various cells of the body. Hemoglobin gives up its oxygen as red cells travel through capillaries in tissues where there is a low content or partial pressure of oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen represents the level of dissolved oxygen in plasma. As oxygen is released and again is carried in solution, the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries becomes greater than the partial pressure of oxygen in the surrounding tissues. This causes oxygen to move out of the capillaries into the tissues and to finally reach the cells. This graph, the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin, shows why hemoglobin is particularly suited to its role in transporting oxygen. The oxygen dissociation curve demonstrates the relationship between the oxygen carried in combination with hemoglobin. The O2 saturation and the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. The sharp upstroke and the flat plateau illustrate how oxygen is released to the tissues over a wide range of conditions. Its shape means that although the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood returning from the lungs and being pumped out by the arteries may be reduced to only 50% of the normal value, say due to lung disease or high altitude, hemoglobin will still be 85% saturated with oxygen. So you saw how oxygen was transported from the lungs to the tissues and how it gave up, it sort of went into the tissues from the capillary. Now let's look, once oxygen goes into the tissues, let's see how carbon dioxide moves into the blood. So notice how 10% in plasma, 
20% bound to hemoglobin and 70% gets converted to bicarbonate ion. Pay attention to this part where how it becomes bicarbonate ion, okay? From tissues, carbon dioxide diffuses into blood where a small amount of it dissolves. The remaining molecules enter the red blood cells where they combine with water and eventually convert to hydrogen and bicarbonate ions. An enzyme found only inside red blood cells speeds up the reaction 250 times. The ions formed during this reaction can dissolve more easily than carbon dioxide itself. These ions make it possible to transport large amounts of the gas in this bicarbonate form. At the lung, the bicarbonate reaction is reversed. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of blood and through the moist walls of the alveoli where exhaling removes it. So let's take a look. So here it showed you how bicarbonate ion was formed. If you got something from the video, one, it referred to an enzyme which was present in the red blood cell, which kind of sped up the reaction of conversion into bicarbonate ion. And then some of the carbon dioxide it mentioned was just dissolved in plasma. It didn't give you this, the rest of carbamino hemoglobin. But let's take a look at it. So here this is transport at tissue level. So this side are the tissue cells. This is blood coming in the capillaries to the tissue cells, okay? So the tissues produce carbon dioxide. The blood coming to the tissues. So this is blood which is coming to the tissues from the lungs. So this is blood from lungs. Or let me, sorry. Let me kind of rephrase that because it shows it. So now this is actually, this is blood which was going to go away from the tissues. Blood from tissues going to the heart. So this is what it's kind of showing you. Okay, blood from the tissues which is going to the heart. The venous blood because it's showing you how carbon dioxide gets in. So here let's say, at, remember, at the tissue level also you had capillaries, and those capillaries which were coming from the lungs, they, they had oxygen bound to it, and most of that oxygen was bound to hemoglobin, okay? So this is that part, so this is, these are capillaries which are present at the tissue level, so there's an arterial end of the capillary and there's a venous end of the capillary. This arterial end of the capillary has a lot of oxygen in it, which is bound to hemoglobin. So if you look at just this part over here, so at the arterial end of the capillary, remember 98% of, of oxygen was bound to hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin bound to oxygen comes, which is known as oxyhemoglobin. When it comes towards the tissues, what it does is it releases oxygen and hemoglobin remains free. Okay, That oxygen diffuses into the tissues. At the tissue level, tissues are metabolizing. They're producing a lot of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide goes from the tissues, it diffuses into the blood, into this venous end of the blood, of which 10% goes just dissolved in plasma. Some of that carbon dioxide, because plasma has water in it, some of that carbon dioxide reacts with water, forms something known as carbonic acid. So H2CO3 is carbonic acid. This reaction is very, very slow. That carbonic acid in time breaks up into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So notice it breaks up into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. You cannot ever, the body never wants to leave hydrogen ions free because if hydrogen ions were left free, what would happen? If we didn't, if we just left this as hydrogen ions. What would happen? Very good. pH would change, right? It would become more acidic because what is pH? pH is the level of free hydrogen ions. The more hydrogen ions you have, the more free hydrogen ions you have, your pH becomes more acidic. 
So you, if we didn't allow, if we left this as such, your blood would get more and more acidic as you kept exercising. So you want to bring about homeostasis. So that's why this hydrogen ion is bound to plasma proteins. Remember in the plasma when we did blood, we had a lot of proteins present in the plasma. And one of the things that those proteins did was they acted as buffers. So this protein mops up these hydrogen ions and so that your pH does not change. A lot of the carbon dioxide gets into the red blood cells. When it gets into the red blood cells, some of that carbon dioxide reacts with that hemoglobin which, was, which got free. See this part of hemoglobin which gave up oxygen and remained as hemoglobin. Some of, that, some of that carbon dioxide reacts with this free hemoglobin and forms something known as carb amino hemoglobin, about 20% of it. The remaining carbon dioxide, when it gets into the red blood cell, inside the red blood cell, you, again, you have water. Water is present in all cells. But inside the red blood cell, you have this enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which makes the reaction really fast. And that was what that green enzyme they showed in that video. It does the same thing. It converts it into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid becomes bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Again, these free hydrogen ions, they are not left loose. What they do is some of the hemoglobin, only some reacted with carbon dioxide, so some hemoglobin is, le is left free. It reacts with that and forms reduced hemoglobin. So even hemoglobin acts like a buffer. This bicarbonate, it diffuses out into the plasma and there, and in return, chloride gets into the red blood cell. So when it diffuses out into the plasma, you can see you have this bicarbonate which comes from the red blood cell and you have this bicarbonate which was formed in the plasma itself. So that's how 70% of carbon dioxide is carried as bicarbonate ions. Have you followed this? Okay, it's very important to... No? Let me, let me go over it again. Yes, okay. So let's take, first let's take this part. So this, this is blood, as I said, most of it is we are looking at the capillaries at the tissue level. So here are the tissue cells and here are the capillaries close to the tissue. Okay, the capillaries have an arterial end and they have a venous end. So this is the venous end of the capillary. Let's take that most of this is the venous end of the capillary. This part is the arterial end. At the arterial end of the capillary, remember there was more oxygen in the, in the capillary, so that oxygen will go into the tissues. The tissues are producing carbon dioxide, that's going to go into the venous end and that's going to be carried away, right? So that's what we are looking at. So here at the capillary level, this cap, these capillaries have a lot of oxygen which is carried bound to hemoglobin. Remember 98% was bound to hemoglobin, so that's what it's bringing. Those red blood cells at the tissue level, they give up the oxygen because that oxygen has to go to the tissue. So they give up the oxygen and then they become free. The hemoglobin becomes free. So this oxygen goes into the tissues and that 2% of oxygen which was dissolved in the plasma, that also gets into the tissue. So the tissues get their oxygen. They have metabolized, they produce a lot of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide now has to get into the venous end of the capillary so that then it can be carried by veins, go to the heart, and from the heart be taken to the lungs. So how do they get into the venous end of the capillary and how are they going to go further? So this carbon dioxide passes through the tissues and gets into the capillaries and about 10% of the carbon dioxide goes just like that, dissolved in the plasma. Some of that carbon dioxide, when it gets into the plasma, plasma is, remember, 55% of it was water. It finds water in that. It reacts with water. This reaction is very slow because there's no enzyme present there. It forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a very unstable acid. It immediately dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So here's the bicarbonate. The hydrogen ions which are formed are not left free. They are quickly bound to plasma protein. So they are buffered by plasma protein. So your pH doesn't change. A lot of the carbon dioxide which is liberated by the tissues gets into the blood cells where some of it, 20% of it, finds this free hemoglobin. So it binds to that and forms carb amino hemoglobin. Okay? 
So not all of the hemoglobin is used up to bind carbon dioxide. We still have some free because remember 98% was bound here to oxygen. So you have 98% free. So only 20% of it binds to carbon dioxide and forms carb amino hemoglobin. So we still have some hemoglobin left here. So let's come back here. A lot of the carbon dioxide gets into the red blood cell where it meets water, much like this. But inside the red blood cell, we have this enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which makes this reaction to carbonic acid really fast. So that's why a lot more gets into the red blood cell, because things can occur faster. Forms carbonic anhydrase, which breaks up into bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. Bicarbonate diffuses out of the red blood cells and into the plasma. So therefore, now you have this bicarbonate formed in the plasma and you have this bicarbonate which is formed in the red blood cell but goes to the plasma. So that's how 70% of carbon dioxide is carried in plasma is bicarbonate ions. The hydrogen ions which are formed inside the red blood cell, they also need to be buffered. They are quickly mopped up by the remaining hydrogen ions and they form something known as reduced hydrogen ions, HHB. Okay? When a negative ion goes out, you need to replace it with another ion. So as bicarbonate moves out of the red blood cell into the plasma, chloride gets into the red blood cell just to balance the negative charge. And that's, why it's, that's what is known as the chloride shift. Have you followed? So here now we have carbon dioxide, 10% dissolved just as carbon dioxide in plasma in a liquid form. 70% as bicarbonate, of which most of which comes actually from the formation inside the red blood cell, but it gets out into the plasma. And 20% bound as carb amino hemoglobin. This is going inside the blood and it will go to the lungs, right? Because it will go to the heart and from the heart it will go by pulmonary artery into the lungs. So now let's see what is happening in the lungs. So here are those capillaries bringing that carbon dioxide. Here's the alveolus of the lungs. So you want carbon dioxide to move from the blood to the alveolus and from the alveolus you want oxygen to move into the capillaries so that then it can come down to the tissue level, right? So let's look at this part. So here we had most of the bicarbonate which was being carried as, a, a, I mean most of the carbon dioxide being carried as bicarbonate. So when it reaches the lungs, what happens is that that bicarbonate, most of it actually now goes back into the red blood cells. Some of it remains in the plasma. The remaining part goes back into the red blood cells. The part which remains in the plasma, the buffers release hydrogen ions. Those plasma proteins, they release hydrogen ions. So it binds with this bicarbonate, forms carbonic acid, which breaks down into water and carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide diffuses from a liquid form into a gaseous form and goes into the alveolus and you breathe it out. Okay? The carbon dioxide, which was dissolved just as liquid form in the plasma, that becomes gaseous, goes into the alveolus, and, and you breathe that out. The bicarbonate, which got into the red blood cell, there the hemoglobin gives off, it again re releases that hydrogen ion, so it reacts with this forms carbonic acid. Again, because of the presence of carbonic anhydrase, the reaction goes in the opposite direction. That carbonic anhydrase helps the reaction to either go this way or this way. So it can facilitate the reaction either way. So here it breaks up. This carbonic acid now breaks up into water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide moves into the alveolus and you breathe it out. From the alveolus, which has more oxygen in it, that oxygen diffuses into the capillaries. 2% travels as dissolved just as li in the liquid form in the plasma. Because that hemoglobin gave off those hydrogen ions, the hemoglobin is free. The carb amino hemoglobin, that also gives off the carbon dioxide, so hemoglobin again gets free. So it reacts with the oxygen and forms oxyhemoglobin. Do you see that? Okay, and that's how it is. This oxyhemoglobin is what is carried here. So this will now be carried and that's what you're seeing in this part. So these two, this and this are basically that whole chain which you saw, right? Remember you saw lungs here, you saw the heart here, and you saw tissues here. 
So you had one thing coming like this and from the heart going to the tissues and from the tissues going to the heart and from the heart going to the lungs, right? So this is how the transport you can see is going in both directions. So oxygen from the, t from the lungs getting into the blood, that same, sorry, that same oxygen coming in the blood and then it will be released at the tissue level, carbon dioxide from the tissues being carried in the blood, that comes to the lungs and it's released to the lungs and you breathe it out. So can you see that whole chain just keeps going round and round, okay? So here, let's look at this question. What is primarily transported from the lungs to the tissues by blood? So just to see if you've understood what is happening. When I say primarily, it is that when you have in the arteries, it isn't as if there's own, there is no carbon dioxide at all. The, the blood is always mixed. There's a lot more oxygen than, in, than carbon dioxide. When you take the veins, there's a lot more carbon dioxide compared to the arteries, okay? But I want to make sure that from the lungs to the tissues, what, which of these gases is the primary gas that's being transported? Very good. It's oxygen. From the lungs to the tissues, you're pu pushing oxygen. What is transported from the tissues to the lungs by the blood? Carbon dioxide, yes, very good. Okay, what makes the reaction faster in the red blood cell? Again, everybody should get this right. We just did this. So this is just a review of, you know, just to make sure, like, some of these concepts stick in your head. enzyme carbonic anhydrase. It's not the hemoglobin. And again, always, always, please, for this is for any class which has a PowerPoint in it, not just my class. Always look at your slide, the label. So look at this. This is fast because of this carbonic anhydrase. You don't have carbonic anhydrase here. And it mentions this reaction up here, which is being fast, okay? So the reaction is because of carbonic anhydrase. So the last of on the respiration, on the physiology was how is respiration actually controlled? So we have these vital centers which are present in the brainstem, in the medulla and the pons. The, in the medulla you have an inspiratory center which is really important. It has two parts to it and that controls the inspiratory muscles. It kind of sends impulses which kind of drives inspiration. So you can see it goes to the diaphragm and goes to the external intercostal, so the two muscles for inspiration. Uh, expiration is passive, so it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't need a special center over there. And apart from those respiratory centers in the pons and the medulla, we have other things which are important, which are chemoreceptors, the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the body is very sensitive to that. And these respond to either the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and it is increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide, or increased hydrogen ion formation, or decreased partial pressure of oxygen levels. So these chemoreceptors respond to this. If they, Think of it, if there's too much carbon dioxide in your body, or too little oxygen in your body. Wouldn't you want your body to react to it, right? 
Too much carbon dioxide will always translate to too much hydrogen ion formation because carbon dioxide reacts with water, forms that carbonic acid, which breaks into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So that's what it. Um, so that's what it'll translate to. You have two types of receptors. One which are called central receptors, which are central chemoreceptors. They, these are present in the medullary region. The central chemoreceptors in the medulla. These respond to just carbon dioxide or hydrogen ions. So increased levels of carbon dioxide and increased levels of hydrogen ions, which you can see here, central chemoreceptors. That means in the central nervous system. Peripheral chemoreceptors are present in the aortic arch and in the carotid arteries. You have little cells present, and these cells are present in the aortic arch as well as the common carotid artery at the bifurcation up there. So these respond to the level of oxygen or the levels of carbon dioxide or hydrogen ions. So if there is decreased partial pressure of oxygen or decreased oxygen levels or increased carbon dioxide or increased hydrogen ion levels, these chemoreceptors will react to them. What they will do at this time is if there is decreased oxygen here or increased carbon dioxide, they will go and stimulate the respiratory center. The respiratory center will go and stimulate the inspiratory muscle so that your ventilation increases and you kind of breathe that excess carbon dioxide out and you take in more oxygen. Okay? And to give you an example, let's say muscles up here, you exercise. When you're exercising a lot, your tissues are metabolizing. When your tissues metabolize, they produce more carbon dioxide, right? Your body probably needs more oxygen too because if you're metabolizing at that point, they, they need more oxygen in, so that they don't go into oxygen death. So what that happens is the blood, the, ox, the carbon dioxide levels in the blood increases and more hydrogen ions will be produced so your buffers are kind of acting over time. So what is the best way to kind of prevent that hydrogen ion levels from increasing? If they stimulate your inspiratory centers and you begin to, your respiratory rate goes up, so you start breathing in more deeply and breathing in more, more often. What will happen? You'll take in more oxygen, but you'll also, because you're breathing more often, you'll also push out more carbon dioxide. So as carbon dioxide is being formed, you're kind of pushing that out. Can you see that? On the other hand, let's say you are at rest, you're sleeping. Where your oxygen levels are okay, you're not producing too much carbon dioxide, these receptors don't need to act at that time. And, you know, your respiratory rate will actually come down from normal. It will, that process is known as hypoventilation. Other areas which act on these, on the respiratory center are, first of all, the brain, up at the brain, you, the cerebral cortex has a voluntary control over breathing. You can hold your breath only for so long, not for too long. Because carbon dioxide is a very, very powerful stimulant. In fact, it's the most powerful stimulant in the body. You, if you hold your breath, what will happen? You're not breathing out, so your carbon dioxide levels keep rising. When they keep rising, it will immediately stimulate. It will rise in the blood. The chemoreceptors, peripheral and central, both will react to it. It will stimulate the inspiratory center, and you'll, you'll, you know, you'll have to start breathing again. Okay. Emotional stimuli, panic attacks or, um, uh, you know, anything that is stress or uh, tragedy. This can, is a plus minus through the <coughs> hypothalamus because the hypothalamus is, is linked to the emotional center. Some people tend to get, they start beginning to hyperventilate. Some people just stop breathing totally, right? Now, when you stop breathing, what happens, you know, they go... In the attack, they'll just sort of hold their breath. Little children often do that. Um, adults probably tend to hyperventilate a bit too much. So when you hyper, when somebody hyperventilates in a panic attack, after some time they may actually stop breathing because what happens is when you hyperventilate, what are you doing? You're breathing up and up deeply and more often, so you're pushing out a lot of your carbon dioxide from your body. You're taking in oxygen, but you're also pushing out a lot of your carbon dioxide. When you push out a lot of your carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide levels in the blood decrease. When they decrease, the respiratory center doesn't get stimulated. 
and you stop breathing. You may stop breathing for some time, you know. So people hyperventilate and suddenly they kind of stop. So this is why we kind of tell them to breathe into a brown paper bag. And the idea of breathing into a brown paper bag is that when you breathe out into the brown paper bag, that expired air becomes your inspired air and that expired air has carbon dioxide. So you're inspiring air which has a lot more carbon dioxide. And again, you breathe out into that brown paper bag, more carbon dioxide you breathe in and that kind of stimulates your respiratory center and you know if you stopped breathing it will come make you come back to normal okay this is another reason why they tell you that uh, you know previously when swimmers uh, went swimming especially in um, competitive things they would sort of take hyperventilate trying to fill their lungs with as much oxygen as possible but at the same time, even though when you hyperventilate, you're trying to fill your lungs with as, as much oxygen. Remember, you're also removing carbon dioxide at that same time. So when they go into water, because the carbon dioxide has been removed, there's no more stimulation. They may get apneic or whatever, you know, they may have an attack where they don't breathe at all, and that could be dangerous. So now if you've ever watched swimmers, they never hyperventilate too much. They just take a couple of deep breaths so that they fill their lungs with enough oxygen without removing too much carbon dioxide. So that stimulant is still there and then they do, you know, then they go about their job, okay? Then um, irritant receptors. Whenever anything irritates your bronchi or bronchioles, it's obvious you do not want to be breathing too much at that time because you'll take that in. So automatically these irritant receptors stop your breathing and instead the cough reflex is initiated and you kind of cough and you usually tend to kind of get that thing out. And another thing is the stretch receptors in the lung. See, inspiration goes on for a particular length of time, after which it stops because you cannot be breathing in endlessly. Because if you kept on inspiring a lot, what would happen? The alveoli would keep on stretching. After some time, if you allowed them to stretch too much, they could rupture, isn't it? So there are actually stretch receptors in the alveolus which when they are stretched to their maximum, they send impulses which inhibit the inspiratory center. That's why inspiration ceases and expiration starts. So these prevent your lungs, uh, your alveoli from being overinflated. okay? And so that's what the negative sign means, that they, they inhibit the inspiratory center so that inspiration stops and expiration will start. Here are some adjustments which uh, happen. Obviously, when you exercise, you produce more carbon dioxide, but you also need to use more oxygen. So your ventilation increases, which is what was called hyperventilation, where you increase your respiratory rate. You increase the rate and increase the depth of ventilation. Which do you think is more important, increasing the rate of ventilation or increasing the depth? Depth would be more important because if you increase the rate, it's like, remember, a beating heart, if it beats very, really fast, there's not enough time for it to relax and fill with air. So similarly, if you just inspire, uh, if you breathe very, very rapidly, you, your breathing could be very shallow, which means that the air is not going in to inflate all of the alveoli. So on the other hand, if you breathe more deeply, then what will happen? Take a deep breath and you breathe often but more deeply with each breath. You would you take air in and inflate more alveoli. So obviously you would you would facilitate gas exchange that increase surface area and then you know your respiration would be better. So during exercise, it's that's why um, uh, athletes when they train, they have to not only train their muscles, they also have to train their breathing. So if you notice an athlete, you will notice that they not only breathe rapidly, but they also breathe more deeply because that's when you can get more oxygen to the tissues. At high altitudes, if you suddenly go from sea level to very high altitudes, you will, you will start feeling sick because the air is rarefied and gas exchange doesn't occur so well. So that's why you have to acclimate to the high altitude. So, you know, when people go mountaineering and so on, they kind of go slowly. They go at each level. They wait for a little time to acclimate. And the reason at this point is that, in, first of all, two ways the body adapts to it. One is when you go from sea level to high altitude, your bone marrow begins to produce more red blood cells so that it can attach to more oxygen. And that is called physiological polycythemia. 
After some time, that polycythemia remains. So you will always have more red blood cells, but it will not keep on increasing. It will kind of remain at a, at a, at a, at a uh, just a normal raised level. Also, because at high altitudes, the air is more rarefied, the attachment of oxygen to the hemoglobin is a bit unstable. So not only does it take up oxygen, but it also gives it up more readily. So when it goes to the tissue, the hemoglobin gives up the oxygen more readily and so that the tissues get the oxygen, which is the primary purpose of respiration, right? To make sure that the tissues are getting their oxygen. So that's how your body kind of acclimates to moving from a sea level to a high altitude. Okay, let's take a look at this question. <clears throat> Yes, it's because the carbon dioxide, when you hold your breath, the carbon dioxide levels increase very, very rapidly. It's the most powerful respiratory stimulant. And that makes sure that the inspiratory center is inhibited and expiration starts. So then the diaphragm, so this is what causes the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles to start relaxing at that time. Okay, so this is most important. Your carbon dioxide levels increase in the blood. Your body does need oxygen. But that's not why you can't hold your breath long. You can't hold it because these levels increase and they stimulate, or rather they inhibit this, uh, the carbon dioxide at that point, they stimulate your respiratory center. Sorry, the diaphragm and don't relax. They stimulate your respiratory center and make sure that the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles come into action so that you start breathing because you're holding your breath at this time, right? So while your body does need oxygen, the reason you cannot hold it is because carbon dioxide levels increase, which is the most powerful stimulant, acts on the respiratory center, makes the inspiratory center start acting, which sends impulses to the diaphragm and the inspiratory muscle, uh, external intercostal, and that begins to contract and you begin to inspire. Okay? You guess, yeah. And that's also because the whole area gets dry. You're holding your breath, there's no humidification at that time. 